This set of notes is on the cephalopoda. We're going to be talking about organisms uh, within the domain Eukarya, within the kingdom Animalia, phylum Mollusca. So all these organisms are the mollusks. And this particular class, surprisingly, is the class Cephalopoda, uh, also known as the cephalopods. Uh, this particular class has uh, a pretty large grouping of different kinds of organisms with some very distinctive similarities. Uh, the name Cephalopoda, the cephalo portion of that name uh, is uh, standing for head, while the poda portion is standing for foot. So these organisms all have a foot near the head, um, very large head with very conspicuous eyes. The organisms in this group, their eyes are very, 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 very large. Uh, it goes along with their very complex sensory systems, complex nervous systems, uh, very, very complicated actually locomotion or movement uh, for these organisms, and they have very, very complicated behaviors as well. We'll talk about those here in a little bit. Uh, for uh, the first little bit on these organisms, we'll talk very briefly here about the digestive system, which we'll get into a little bit more when we do the activity uh, with these cephalopods. Uh, for their digestive system, most of all of these organisms have jaw-like beaks. So think of a beak like a parrot beak comes together and uh, kind of pinches, and that beak is there for ripping and tearing uh, flesh. Uh, these guys uh, sometimes, not all of them, some of them have poisonous glands. Um, they do have a radula. It is present, uh, as is very unique to uh, organisms within this group, the mollusks. Their beak is not the radula. The radula is located behind the beak, it's kind of like a tongue that helps to pull those chunks of flesh that that beak is scraped off uh, into the rest of the digestive uh, system. Uh, Locomotion-wise, it's this next part here, uh, <coughs> their foot has been modified into the sections of 8 to 10 arms or tentacles. An organism like the octopus has 8 arms. Uh, the squid, they have 8 arms, 2 tentacles. Uh, cuttlefish, uh, they have 8 arms, 2 tentacles. Um, organisms like this nautilus over here have several hundred arms uh, for some of the larger ones. And we'll talk a little bit more about those guys here in just a moment. They also have a structure called a siphon, which is this particular portion of the mantle that forms a tube. And in the picture here, siphon's located just behind the head. So we have the, the arms here and these uh, tentacles that shoot out and grab a hold of their food. And this siphon here uh, is right at that mantle cavity. The uh, organism will open up that mantle cavity, allow water to flow in here, and then it'll squeeze down that mantle cavity very violently with some significantly strong muscles, push down, and all the water in there is forced out. All the water is forced out through this siphon, which acts as this jet which shoots them through the water. So they can move in a couple different ways. They can move by uh, using those arms, uh, pushing and pulling uh, on things, whether it's the, the ground or other organisms. Uh, and they can use this siphon to jet along uh, in the water. So uh, that's a, a very unique structure, getting these organisms to move very quickly uh, through the water. Uh, these guys um, also, uh, for a lot of them, have fins on the edge of the body. It's tough to see in some of these particular uh, octopus, and uh, the nautilus have them reduced, but squid, you can kind of see them over here on the very end of the body, have these fins to allow them to maintain um, a kind of the, uh, an orientation in the water. So they're not spinning all around as they're moving through, they're moving through at, at a very particular level. Uh, these guys also uh, have an ink sac, and what very unique characteristics for the uh, cephalopoda. Uh, and this ink sac uh, located inside the organism, inside that mantle cavity, uh, they're able to squeeze on that ink sac and shoot out those particular pigments through that siphon, creating this cloud in the water, a great defense mechanism uh, for them to escape predators. Their nervous system is highly advanced. They have this cerebral ganglia uh, in the head, right uh, in between the eyes right there. Not a brain, uh, but it's very, very, very well-developed cerebral ganglia. And then these organisms also have the uh, ventral 
uh, and dorsal nerve cords. So two of these nerve cords um, that are running into the, uh, are one running into the foot area and one running into that visceral mass location. Uh, their skeletal system kind of varies uh, just a little bit uh, depending on the organisms. Uh, they all utilize a hydrostatic skeleton to give them their basic shape, uh, except, as you can see in the nautilus up here, they do have a very, very distinctive shell. Uh, an octopus, that shell has been completely lost. The unique thing about the octopus and their hydrostatic skeleton is they can squeeze into spaces that are as small as their eye. So anything that's the size of their eye or larger, an octopus can fit into. Uh, squid, they have a particular shell that's actually inside the organism. It's kind of almost like a plastic uh, piece, um, but it is made up of that calcium carbonate. It is very, very, very thin. It does provide them some stability and some structure here in uh, the body of the organism. And then organisms like the cuttlefish, uh, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. Uh, the cuttlefish do have a shell similar to the squid, but it's much thicker. Uh, and I'll try and show you one of those in uh, class next time. Uh, their ecology, their habitat, these organisms are strictly uh, in the marine environment. We don't see any of these organisms in the freshwater. Uh, usually you'll find them in relatively deep waters, but a few of the species, especially those cuttlefish, some species of octopus are going to be found in relatively uh, shallower waters. Uh, but they're going to be found where the, their prey organisms are located. There are some squid that live thousands of feet deep, and then there are uh, octopus that live, uh, you know, a couple of feet deep. Uh, we'll find these guys usually in the warmer waters, tropical waters, so not a lot of octopus off of our coastline here in northern California. There are some squid from time to time that we'll see uh, coming up here and we'll uh, take a look at some of those organisms here in uh, just a little bit. All of these guys are predators and they are going after prey organisms. Whether those organisms are, are uh, shrimp and crabs or whether they're other fish, these guys are highly successful predators. They'll capture their prey with their tentacles uh, first shooting out their arms, they have them grabbing the prey item, bringing them in, holding them um, and with their arms. So they shoot out these tentacles, hold them with the arms, and, and then they use that beak to rip and shred uh, the flesh of the organism. Not the best way to go if you're a prey item for one of these cephalopods. Uh, a couple types of cephalopods we'll be looking at here. Uh, here are some squid. These are what we call the market squid. We'll actually have an opportunity to do the dissection on these guys. Usually about 8 to, uh, to 12 inches in length. Uh, but great examples of these. Uh, we have uh, organisms like the uh, giant Pacific octopus. Uh, we've got the uh, nautilus here. We'll talk a little bit about those guys. Here's another picture of one of the nautilus coming right at you. You can see the siphon uh, a little bit right here. It's a kind of circular area. And then uh, the cuttlefish, of which uh, we've watched a little video on. Those guys are very, very cool uh, organisms. We've got about 650 different species of these particular organisms that we have alive uh, today. Uh, the Nautilus, first up, here's a kind of a sketch rendering of uh, the Nautilus. You can see the shell back here. The unique thing about the uh, shell for the Nautilus is that the most of this shell is empty. It's actually uh, filled with gases. They have a tube that runs through. They can regulate the gases that are in the shell. Helps to give them some buoyancy. Uh, the shell protects them. That hard covering here. The main body of the organism is uh, here in this uh, front portion. And that's the big thing with the Nautilus, is the, the shell that it has, that it retains here. So here's the body of the organism, these arms sticking out here, and the siphon again. And this shell back here, uh, by changing the levels of the gases that are in that shell, uh, it helps them to maintain that buoyancy. Uh, so that's the Nautilus. Uh, living out in the open ocean, humans typically don't interact very much with the Nautilus. They're not up close to, to the shore too often. Uh, again, uh, another little picture of these guys cruising around. You can see the eye uh, right here on the side. And again, here's the shell and the body of the organism right over here. Uh, the next one as an example of these organisms, the blue ring octopus. 
a few different pictures showing some of the colorations. But what you should be noticing is that they have this very distinctive blue ring uh, around the whole body. You can see some of these over here uh, in this one, uh, the blue rings there, and uh, over here in this particular picture. This is the most venomous octopus, the blue ring octopus. They're not very big. Uh, they catch their prey with uh, its arms and bite them with their beak, just like all these other um, cephalopods do. But in its saliva, in the mucus that is actually within these organisms' uh, beak, when they bite, that mucus, the saliva, is going to enter into their prey organism, and that particular mucus, that saliva, uh, has poison, a neurotoxin in it. Uh, and that neurotoxin is very effective, kills organisms extremely quickly. Well, if we get bit by one of these, uh, you probably won't make it back to shore. That's how effective that toxin is on uh, changing how your nerves are actually working. Uh, this guy lives in the warm, shallow reefs uh, in Australia, New Guinea, uh, Indonesia, the Philippines, that kind of area. Uh, and uh, these guys, they don't live very long. Uh, like we learned about a little bit with those cuttlefish, they live fast. Uh, about a year and a half is uh, the length of time for these particular organisms of life span. So that's the blue ring octopus, uh, one of the more deadly organisms in the oceans. Giant Pacific octopus, this guy is the one off of our coastline. It's the largest species of octopus in the world. We'll see these uh, in Monterey Bay Aquarium, uh, in Aquarium of the Pacific down in uh, Long Beach. Uh, these guys are very common uh, off of our shore. Most individuals uh, weigh a little bit less than 100 pounds, so these are substantial sized organisms. The biggest one uh, that we've captured was up near uh, Victoria, British Columbia in 1967 was about 156 pounds, uh, about 23 feet from uh, arm tip to arm tip. So that's not from the arms to the end of the organism, that's from one arm tip to the other arm tip. Um, usually living on the continental shelf, you can see, especially in this picture here, all these all white circular things, those are all the suckers that are on the arm, act just like suction cups. They actually use these suckers to do a little tasting. Oh, so, uh, very much like our taste buds on our tongue, these suckers can sense uh, chemicals in the water. That's all our taste buds do, is sense chemicals that we're putting into our mouth. So these guys will often put their arms up, and you can see that with the cuttlefish. They'll put those two arms up and wave them around, and they're basically tasting the water. Um, when they grab an organism, they're grabbing your arm, you're putting your hand in there, and they're, they're, they're feeling your fingers, etc. They're actually tasting you to see if, in fact, this is uh, an item that they should grab a hold of uh, and start eating. Uh, these guys typically live three to five years. You can kind of see the size when you look at this picture right here of this giant Pacific octopus. It's got a shark. Now, this isn't a very big shark. Uh, but still, you think of sharks as, you know, the top of the food chain. These amazing killing machines that can go after everything and anything. And this octopus is uh, having one of those for its meal. Uh, here's another one, giant squid, one that people have probably heard of uh, before. Here's a giant squid laying out on this tarp, kind of getting ideas to the size compared to uh, some of these people. This is a very large organism, and we actually have never seen a giant squid alive in its natural habitat. We've seen some dying as they are up uh, near the surface, uh, but we've never seen one alive in its natural habitat. Here's the beak of a uh, giant squid, so somebody's holding on to it. They've peeled back uh, all of the arms, and then you can see these two really long tentacles here, uh, and uh, open up the beak. And this area right here, it's a little tough to see. It's kind of this goldish color. This is the radula that's inside, it's a little spiky tongue. Uh, and that's what helps to pull that food into the organism. Well, we know about that because uh, well, we hunted whales for a long time. Sperm whales love to eat these guys. They dive extraordinarily down deep where these giant squid are living, several thousand feet deep, and uh, they go after them. Um, and so when we hunt the sperm whales and they come back up to breathe, uh, we were able to uh, get some of these giant squid that are in the stomachs of the sperm whale, so we've known about them for uh, several centuries. Uh, we've been seeing them washed up on beaches, caught in fishermen's nets, uh, and that's uh, where we get some of these uh, giant squid. Go up to uh, about 70 meters long, so from the tip all the way to where those arms are extended, um, and their tentacles can extend out about 36 feet. 
So uh, that's uh, give or take about 12 yards or so. So these are, are very, very large organisms. Uh, some of them have, uh, have been caught and weighed up to about four metric tons. So we're talking huge, huge organisms. Then, of course, we've got the cuttlefish, flamboyant cuttlefish. We looked at that in the video over here. Uh, here's another one, a little more common cuttlefish. And, and I put this picture, these pictures up here just to show you that variation in color. Um, these guys do use those chromatophores, but we've done a little bit uh, activity with those chromatophores already, so I'm not going to get into too much detail. You've had enough on uh, that, how those uh, uh, organisms use muscle control to actually pull on uh, cells that are filled with these pigments, um, and then these different layers of cells, etc. So we've got these uh, different cuttlefish uh, here uh, showing these variations in the colorings uh, that they potentially have. Um, they have the cuttle bone, which is inside this organism, uh, inside the mantle right up here. Uh, and we'll take a look at uh, one of those cuddle bones. Uh, it's made of calcium carbonate, Ca for calcium, and then CO3 for the carbon and the oxygen. Um, and this uh, particular cuddle bone gives them that, that significant structure and shape uh, that doesn't fluctuate uh, very much. These guys really are amazing at, uh, at, at changing color. And they actually change color not just for camouflage, but for moods. Uh, you know, they turn this bright red color, they're, they're angry, they're upset, something's not going their way. Just like when people get angry uh, or upset and we turn bright red or when we're embarrassed. It's the same kind of idea. Uh, we have blood rushing, it's because our, our muscles are changing and dilating uh, our, our capillaries, and so we do change color as well. Uh, and these guys just have a little bit different way of actually changing this color. But you can tell what a cuttlefish is, is almost feeling. If it's angry, if it's sad, if it's happy, uh, uh, if it's mad, by the colorings that it uh, goes through. And when it gets excited, it usually gets this like deep color, like maroonish kind of color. Uh, that's when it's getting excited and it's about ready to strike. But these guys are really, really cool. I've had the opportunity to have a couple of cuttlefish in my care when I was working at UC Davis. Uh, and uh, uh, had several of them actually there, just phenomenal organisms. Got to the point, because I was the one feeding them, that whenever I would walk by the tank, they would get excited and start flashing and turning these red colors because they associated me with the food. Uh, and so they would watch me and follow me around. They're pretty big tanks that they were in. Uh, but these guys are just phenomenal, phenomenal organisms. Uh, that's uh, all for uh, the cephalopods. We'll get into the rest of the uh, mollusks here over the course of the next couple of days.